Good morning, Christ Covenant. It's a pleasure to be with you. My name is Peter Yoder. I serve as a lecturer in historical theology at Reformed Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas. Um, I'm uh, honored to be a part of this series on perspectives from the past, wisdom for the present. Currently, or today, we'll be, or this morning, we'll be talking about pandemics, plagues, and church history. I'm especially grateful for the opportunity to chat with y'all um, because at the very beginning of the pandemic, one of the PCA's ministries, uh, it's called Ministry to the State, reached out to me to do an interview uh, about church history and and its interaction or, or its or the plagues and um, and and since then I feel like we've all go- grown accustomed to things that were very strange to us then. Uh, we've uh, gone through much more. We've dealt with uh, this pandemic in, in a much more tangible way than than very early on when things were so uncertain. Uh, and so I feel like there's even more that we can discuss uh, together. Uh, so I not only want to draw on things that I've talked about before, uh, but also today maybe present some material, some ideas, some thoughts that might encourage us uh, in our walk with the Lord, encourage us as we seek to uh, love God and love our neighbors. So with that in mind, um, I wanted to present to you three different uh, portions today. And so for those of you who are taking notes, we're going to address three different sections through this time together. Uh, The first section we'll call a historical introduction. We're going to look specifically at four different moments in which the church dealt with plagues. Some of them we'll spend more time in. Some of them we won't uh, spend much time at all in. Uh, But this uh, initial uh, topic will be a sort of a historical introduction to the church and plagues. In our second discussion, we'll look at some of the biblical, uh, some biblical passages that will provide us uh, some backing and understanding as to uh, how we might appropriately react or how the church uh, reacted earlier and how we might uh, rightly be uh, um, uh, might rightly address the situations uh, with in the light of uh, the scripture and uh, and then our last uh, our last uh, theme together topic together will be more of an application we'll kind of ask the question now that we've seen what has occurred uh, through the history of the church uh, how then should we uh, react to our own situations and how should we live in our contexts. Uh, so I'm really grateful for this time. Again, we'll have a historical introduction, then we'll look at some biblical passages together and apply them to both what the ch- church, how the church had reacted and maybe our own situations. Then lastly, we'll have a time of application where we'll ask the questions, how should we now um, live c- uh, considering what we've learned today in our own contexts? Um, so uh, to enter into uh, the historical introduction together, um, there are, we, we want to look at four different moments uh, in the history of the church where it was dealing with plagues. Um, the first one uh, for our time together is the plague of Cyprian from 250 to 262. It is not the first plague that the church dealt with. In 160, uh, under the reign of Marcus Aurelius, the uh, the church also was dealing with an outbreak of smallpox that it's claimed uh, an estimate of 2,000 people per day in Rome and, and upwards of 5 million altogether died from this early plague. But this uh, plague in the uh, third century, 250 to 262, called the Plague of Cyprian, they estimate that about 5,000 individuals died per day in Rome. Um, and more recently, there's been an article offered in which um, it's claimed that it, was, it wasn't the smallpox that had caused uh, the plague, but rather some sort of outbreak of an Ebola-like virus. Um, they've gained most of that from reading the text and seeing how people describe death uh, uh, at that time. Uh, what's maybe very important for us as we consider this first plague and, and how the church reacted to it uh, is that it occurred right uh, at the very front end of what we call the Decian persecution, the persecution under the emperor Decius. And why that's important for us is because uh, it, what De- uh, Decius' gr- uh, persecution um, was a moment in which he presented an edict that all Christians had to give worship to the Roman gods. And why it's important for us here is because uh, were the Christians, were a Christian not to give right worship, so to speak, to a Roman god, they were not merely just disobeying the edict of the Roman emperor. And a lot of times, um, uh, we oftentimes um, 
only assume the persecutions were uh, that occurred with Christianity were something between the emperor and the Christian church. But what we find is that uh, persecutions dealt with dealt in the context of communities. And so as a Christian and as a Christian community, when we chose not to worship Roman emperors, we were actually tearing at the fabric of society. We were actually challenging, uh, so would be assumed by Romans of the time, the safety and security of their, uh, of their communities and societies when we weren't willing to worship their gods because uh, how would the gods react to those pesky Christians who were unwilling to worship them other than to bring about their wrath. And so in, in the connection here, this early plague, this plague of Cyprian was oftentimes, um, uh, it was off uh, the Christians were, were blamed for because they weren't doing right worship to the Roman gods. And so it's very interesting, the overlap between the Decian persecution at this time and the plague of Cyprian in which Christians uh, were being uh, uh, persecuted not only for their faith, but also persecuted because uh, they were to blame, so to speak, for uh, the plague itself. Um, uh, I failed to mention before, what we'll do for each one of these plagues is we'll talk both about the historical facts behind it, not all of them, obviously, we don't have time for that, but also we'll talk about the Christian reactions uh, to the plague themselves. Themselves. So uh, initially, uh, the plague of Cyprian um, was connected at some level to uh, it was was uh, sorry. Initially, um, we see that this plague, in some way, the Romans were connecting it to Christians' unwillingness to worship their gods. Uh, what we find fascinating is the response of Christians themselves to the plague. And so, what I want to do is read you two um, quotes from two different bishops of the time. Uh, and uh, the first one is from Bishop Dionysius of Alexandria. Um, he, you may be familiar with this quote. Uh, there's a, a popular, um, a pa a popular uh, section of a book by Rodney Stark. He wrote a book called The Triumph of Christianity. He's a uh, retired or emeritus socio uh, professor of sociology from Baylor. And uh, a lot of people have been quoting uh, his work on the plagues because of how, important, how much emphasis he puts on the importance of the Christian reaction during these early plagues. Uh, but this quote um, from uh, Dionysius of Alexandria, uh, he writes this, Most of our brothers show unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. The best of our brothers lost their lives in this manner. A number of presbyters, deacons, and laymen winning high commendation so that in death in this form, the result of great piety and strong faith seems in every way the equal to martyrdom. Now, what I find very interesting about this passage um, is that last statement that Dionysius makes. <clears throat> he writes this, The best of our brothers lost their lives in this manner, a number of presbyters, deacons, and laymen winning high commendation, so that in death in this form, the result of great piety and strong faith seems in every way equal to martyrdom. Now, what I try to note is, he draw, is that Dionysius draws on the idea of martyrdom. In the early church, martyrdom was closely connected to imitation of Christ. In fact, there are early apost apostolic fathers who uh, wanted to be martyred because they felt that that was a fulfillment of the imitation of Christ. But what we find here is that the Bishop of Alexandria is saying that those who cared for the dying and poor uh, during this time should also, and died from the plague as they cared for those, should in some way also be considered martyrs as they were imitating Christ. And that's a beautiful connection that he makes for us there, uh, that that care for the poor is something uh, that too, that dying as they cared for, that too could be seen as an act of martyrdom. The second quote uh, that I wanted to, uh, 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 to, to read to us is from Cyprian himself. Cyprian is the Bishop of Carthage, and he has a writing called On the Plague. And in that writing, he says this, what a grandeur of spirit it is to struggle with all the powers of an unshakable mind against so many onsets of devastation and death. What sublimity to stand erect amid the desolation of the human race. 
and not to lie prostrate with those who have no hope in God, but rather to rejoice and to embrace the benefit of the occasion, that in thus bravely showing forth our faith and by suffering endured, going forward to Christ by the narrow way that Christ trod, we may receive the reward of his life and faith according to his own judgment. Again, here Cyprian notes something that we just kind of briskly or quickly read over, but I wanted you to see in the middle of that passage, he references essentially a hope in God. What compelled the Christians to react to the plague the way they did? And I'll get to that in just a moment, or the benefit of their reaction, so to speak, in just a moment. But here, uh, Cyprian uh, references the hope in God. Christians had such a strong hope in God that they understood their calling in the midst of the plague, that they were to care for their neighbor, they were to love God, and to care for their neighbor. Rodney Stark goes on to claim in his book um, that because Christians cared for uh, those around us while the Romans left those who were suffering from the plague to die, because Christians gave them simply uh, food and water, that the, the survival rate among the Christian community was much higher than it was among the Romans. The next um, uh, moment in which the church encountered the plague is probably the one we're most familiar with. It's uh, the Great Black Death or the Black Death or the Great Plague that occurred between 1347 and 1352. Um, this occurred in Europe, uh, and it's, uh, it, it, it's during a period of great, we might say tumult, great um, um, unrest. Uh, the 14th century was a time of a lot of uh, unrest in Europe. Uh, there, there, there are a lot of ways that we could approach that unrest as we introduce this plague, but let's just look at three points. Number one, uh, one of the uh, ways this unrest uh, both arose and even was expressed was something we was a moment which we call the Avignon Papacy. Uh, it was uh, it was a time in which, uh, in the start of the 14th century, the Pope in Rome decided to move uh, the papacy to Avignon in France. Many th that expressed many things political and spiritual at the time, uh, but for our sake right now, what I want to what I want to bring up is that really um, uh, brought about a sense of dislocation and disunity within the church. And so, during the 14th century, as we had Pope after Pope in Avignon instead of Rome, which had this long tradition of being the center of the church, uh, there there was a, a growing sense of uh, of unrest and unsurety and disunity, and dislocation within the church because of that. The second thing uh, that I wanted to bring up for you uh, was that there was, uh, some historians note that there was a cooling in the climate during the time. And so uh, there was a lower yield in the crops and economic trouble during the 14th century that we haven't seen in some of the other periods uh, of church history. And so we see also an economic struggle for individuals and, and life was simply harder because of this cooling of the, uh, of the climate. And thirdly, uh, I wanted to bring up that during this time we sort of see uh, not a culmination, but a, a high point in what I would call Eucharistic devotion. And what I mean by that is that by this time, the church had developed a very um, a very uh, complex and almost confusing um, <clears throat> devotion and worship of the Eucharist, of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the century before, in the 13th century, the church dogmatized. That, that is, they made official the doctrine of transubstantiation. And that was the belief that the bread and wine in its substance became the body and blood, body and blood, the literal body and blood of Christ. Uh, and so that became a dogma, a, a official teaching of the church. And by the 14th century, there had been so much um, popularity. Uh, and I say that simply as a, a love for creating ways in which you and I could use the Eucharist as a means of becoming closer to God, uh, as a means of assuring ourselves of our salvation, as a means of, uh, um, as a means of constructing an edifice of salvation that wasn't through Jesus Christ directly. And here's what I here's what I mean by that. Uh, by this time, there was a popular procession. That is, they would take the bread, the host, and they would process it through the city. One example of this is the Corpus Christi Festival, which is still celebrated today. And it's a procession in which the host is, is, uh, is, is held up high and walked through the city. Uh, the churches would uh, unite together in this, and people would stand along the road simply to behold the host, the body of Christ, it was assumed, as it went by. 
But as I mentioned, this kind of popular piety, this popular belief in what the Eucharist could do for you, there was a belief that if I just catched a glimpse of the host going by, that I would be blessed, I would receive the grace of God, it would be salvific for me. So I was not merely just distanced from participating in the Eucharist, participating in the bread, uh, which was occurring at least, you had to at least once a year go uh, and do penance and participate in the Eucharist, but now I was able to be a bit more removed than that. So not only am I being removed from the gospel of Jesus Christ and placing it upon a ritual, but now I'm being further removed from that and it's being placed upon uh, a, an abstraction of that ritual. That is just the, the host, the body of Christ, walking by me was enough to provide me with a sense of salvation. And so there's this groundswell of popular piety which was expressing itself in a lot of different ways. And so as the plague, or the great plague hit in the middle of the century, there was a lot of uh, consequences to it. The, the church reacted in a lot of different ways, both good and bad. But let me give you some of the, the facts or the, the, the historical background of this plague itself. Uh, it's estimated that about one-third of the population in Europe died from the bubonic plague. So it was uh, this bubonic plague, which was passed along uh, specifically through flea and, and rat bites. Uh, it's assumed, uh, it's also assumed that it came from Central Asia and passed through the Silk Road uh, and then, um, and, and was passed by soldiers traveling back into the West. Um, and so one third, about 30% of the population of Europe died from the plague. John Kelly, in his book, The Great Mortality, uh, states that 42 to 45% of the clergy died. Their mortality rate was higher by 12 to 15% than the actual mortality rate of the population. And I guess that kind of draws us to the question, why? Why would the mortality rate of priests be higher than that of parishioners? And I think that speaks um, one, to the specific understanding of the priest's responsibilities, but also speaks to the mindset of the church during this period. So uh, we're going to get to some of the, uh, the warts and the good points of how the church reacted, but I want to bring up just one of the things that often gets overlooked, and that is the assumed responsibilities of the priest. A, a Catholic theologian mentions that uh, priests are assumed to have to act within justice and charity, justice and charity. Now, justice here is not simple. Is not what you might be thinking. This justice here is simply that you are obligated as a priest to fulfill what you've contracted yourself to do. So, simply, maybe better said, the priest understands himself to do what is just in his office, and so a priest felt obligated. Uh, because of his position or his office within the church to care for those who are dying. That is coupled with the understanding of charity. Simply said, the priest understood his office's role to love his sheep, to be a shepherd of his sheep. So a good priest who is taking account of this was both compelled uh, by a knowledge of God and Christ, was compelled by a sense of the justice of his op office and the um, the, the charity that he is to make or to do. We also have to remember that at this time, the sacraments play such a central role to the life of the church. And what I mean by that, they, they become the means by which we can receive the salvation of Christ. We receive what we call the merits of Christ in this medieval church by participating faithfully with uh, the sacraments of the church. That's not something that we as Protestants hold. We believe that salvation comes through faith in Christ, justified by faith and through the grace of God. Uh, but here in the medieval church, there is a, a intermediary between us and the merits of Christ, and that was the church providing us the sacraments uh, in which we might participate in that. And so the priest had a special role in offering those sacraments to individuals, especially uh, as they are dying. In this context, the most powerful of sacraments uh, were not only the Eucharist, but also baptism and penance and last rite. And so this last rites was the priest going to those who were dying off in, this, in the midst of this offering the Eucharist and offering, also offering um, individuals the opportunity to seek penance and reconciliation with God. Now, while many priests did flee during this time and did seek and did not hold their responsibilities, there are also many, uh, many testimonies of priests who did stay and care for the dying. Uh, especially especially uh, uh, um, administering the sacraments to those who are dying. Um, the loss of, uh, of clergy at this time was so great that Clement VI 
uh, at this time was began to allow individuals who weren't ordained uh, to uh, to uh, hear confession uh, to, uh, of the dying. Uh, in fact, um, the death of the clergy uh, was so rampant that after the plague had passed, um, the uh, there was such a dearth in clergy that the, the new round of those becoming ordained were not well educated, didn't understand the implications of their office. In fact, um, Chaucer's uh, The Summoner and Pardoner in his Canterbury Tales is, a, is sort of a mocking of those, uh, a maligning uh, is what Daniel Siblinski says, of the clergy of those years who weren't trained well, who came in after the devastation of the clergy in a post-plague moment. Now, what I wanted to spend a little bit of time with here with you is discussing the Christian reaction uh, to the plague at this time. Number one is, and we mentioned this earlier, there was sort of this, um, this explosion of lay piety, of individual piety, attempts to make myself right with God. The underlying reason for that is because this plague, as, as often as the case, was associated with the judgment of God. People believe that the plague going through Europe, and as the plague comes up further and further throughout history, the bubonic plague comes up again and again, um, it's, all, it's almost always associated with the judgment of God. We had done something wrong, the church had done something wrong, the people of Europe had done something wrong, and God was judging them. And so there were multiple ways that people contrived in order to appease the wrath of God. Uh, penitential processions, Remember, I mentioned the Corpus Christi procession, but that wasn't, was, was one of others in which the Eucharist played a central role um, and people processed through the cities in order to appease the wrath of God. People began attending at mass more often. There were new forms of fasting and prayers. Uh, the, the, the rise of amulets and, amulets and charms and, uh, and also the rise of, um, of various types of rituals uh, and various relics uh, in order to appease God during this time. One of the underlying issues here is that people felt a tension because they were to make a perfect penance, a perfect confession in order to enter into heaven. And people felt that tension. What if I were to get the plague and I hadn't made a perfect profession of faith? And theologians in their works during this time were discussing this. Well, well, we would say then, they would, they would say that, that the merits of Christ through the sacraments would, would, over, would, would outweigh an imperfect penance done for that time. So there was a rise in, pi in, in lay piety and in, in piety among common people. One of the challenges there is that that took away uh, the influence and authority, the centrality of the activity of the churches. That meant that, hey, you know, I can, I can do church on my own. I can uh, do these things that are apart from the church, and they offer me the same benefits that the church saw. And so there, be, there also was a clamping down on some of those lay pious activities simply because they challenged the centrality and authority of the church. The second thing uh, that, that uh, occurred, the Christian reaction, uh, was a, a, a persecution of other groups. One of the more famous of this is the persecution of Jews that occurred during uh, this plague. Specifically, there, there arose this um, repetition of the idea that Jews were, uh, the Jewish communities were poisoning wells. And due to the poisoning of these wells, it was causing the death and plague. And so uh, one historian uh, writes that uh, about 210 Jewish community, communities were persecuted uh, during this time, both small and large. Uh, he uses the language of de they were devastated by mob killings. Uh, as I mentioned before, this piety movements, uh, this piety ri rise of lay piety, also led to various other movements. One of them is called the flagellant movement, and so this extreme emphasis on penitence led individuals to to literally uh, process through cities and from city to city, groups of them uh, striking their bodies as a way of showing God how remorseful they are for their sins, so that He would take the plague away. One of the more dramatic examples I, I wanted to share with you, because we might draw on this later again, is in the, a German city in Halle. It's where I, I studied myself. And uh, during this plague, during the 14th century, there was an outbreak in this city in Germany. Um, and, and in order to, uh, you know, how might we say this? In order to protect themselves, the citizens of this town decided to essentially wall off the specific small community in the town wall off and board up all of the people that lived in this infected community to the point where they starved to death. 
and as it's written or as, as the story goes, 10 years after this, they, they eventually open the doors or open the walls up to walk into this small community in the town of Hala, and they found grass growing all over the place. Grass had grown through the streets and into the houses and everywhere, and, it, and, it, and the name uh, Way of the Grass or Grassy Way, Grasa Veg, was what... Um, was applied or, or renamed for this uh, this area. So there was very very um, dramatic ways in which Christians themselves dealt with the plague that did not express what we'd assume to be the appropriate charitable love of Christ towards others. Um, we might note here um, also the plague arose during the life of Luther. Um, and, and, and you may have had the chance to read the letter that Luther wrote to another pastor in Cilicia about it, encouraging pastors to be wise about their decisions, uh, but to care for those in their communities and not to flee and uh, to love the sick. Uh, Luther's own family was affected by the plague because of his own choice to stay in the city of Wittenberg and care for the people of his uh, city. So this care for those uh, in the community, this lo- this expression of love of Christ and caring through people in the plague. And lastly, this last um, uh, moment of the plague that I thought I would bring up was would be the great plagues of Vienna and London in the 1660s and the 1670s. Um, it was it was really the the last major occurrence of the bubonic plague in London. And as as I mentioned before, I want to draw on Halle again. It it also made its way up to that German town where I studied Halle uh, in 1681 and 83. And there again, half the population of the city was uh, killed by the bubonic plague, leaving about 4,000 individuals. Um, And uh, why I bring this up is because it was on the heels of um, of the rise of uh, German pietism. Uh, both the Pietists and the Puritans also dealt with the plague. And interestingly enough, and I think we'll discuss this a little bit later as we get to the application, their, a lot of their immediate, um, a lot of times their immediate reaction was to say, um, not merely repent, but also you need to stop uh, the common things that brings God judgment, going to theaters and playing cards and dancing and drinking. So they address the outward acts of the individual uh, because they were concerned about the inward uh, sub- uh, subjective status of the heart of these individuals. The, 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 the person that I study, a gentleman named August Schumann Franke, in fact, entered into Halle about 10 years after the plague had occurred there. And, and from his perspective, he saw a town that had been ravaged and had, been, had, had given itself to drinking and, and economic devastation. And, and it led to many of the, of the, of the works uh, of his institutes that had cared for the poor and hospitals and, uh, and, and missions work. So there's this great benefits that arose. And oftentimes there was also a distortion of the way that God works and the way that salvation is, a, is offered to us in Christ. So we looked at four different um, uh, uh, moments in which the church was dealing with the plague. The first was the plague of Cyprian. The second was the great plague in the 14th century. The third was Luther's own moment. And the fourth, just briefly, we mentioned these plagues at the end of the 17th century. That brings us uh, to our our next section, our larger section, where we're going to discuss maybe Biblical passages for living in the midst of a pandemic or a plague. Biblical passages that will help us uh, be grounded uh, in, in God's word as we live in the midst of the pandemic. The first one is from John 9, from John chapter 9. So if you do have your Bibles with you, you can turn to John chapter 9, and I'll be reading from the beginning of the passage, and I may pick up some areas throughout the chapter there. So John chapter 9. And it begins as this, and I'm reading from the, uh, the ESV. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And as his parents, uh, or as his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that his ma- this man sinned or his parents, but the works of God might be displayed in him. We, was, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. He then anointed the man's eyes with the mud, 
and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now I want to I skip a little bit further to verse 13. They, bought, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked again him, asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. And some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. And let's continue all the way down to the bottom of the passage. Verse 35, And Jesus heard that they had cast this man out, this healed man out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe the Son of Man? And he answered him, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him. It is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see me uh, who do not see may see, and those who see may come, become blind. And some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Now I wanted to maybe point out two things in this passage that I think are very important. The first and foremost is the moment that we look at, mo at situations like the plagues or our own pandemic, uh, we should avoid and we should be uh, we should avoid at all costs the claim that it's the judgment of God on a specific person or people group of people. What we do know is we can't make the claim that it's the judgment of God, but what we can see in the scripture is that these moments occur that God might be glorified. And to build on that even more, it's not merely a vague that God might be glorified, but that Christ might be glorified. Because it's not merely that Jesus says this occurred so that God might be glorified, but if we looked at the at verses uh, 38 and 39, when the man heard who Jesus was, he worshiped Jesus directly. So Jesus Christ received the glory uh, that is due to God because Jesus himself is the Son of God. And so there's this huge implication that these tragedies uh, are for the glory of God, though we continue to struggle and wrestle, uh, especially with uh, the realities of them and, and the hardships of them uh, and the ways and the things that, that we ourselves experience through these pandemics. Nevertheless, we have the confidence and comfort. Uh, so the gospel tells us that all of these things before us occur that God might be glorified. Secondly, I want you to note that Jesus seems to do a twist for those uh, Pharisees. If you'll notice before, they're concerned somewhat about the judgment of God upon this individual's sins. Is this guy suffering because of his sins? To which Jesus replies, no. Uh, he's not suffering because of his sins, but rather because uh, uh, the, because the God would be glorified in this moment. But at the end, he Jesus draws back on the idea of judgment. He says, uh, "For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind." Some of the Pharisees near him he, near him heard these things and said, "Are we also blind?" And Jesus said to them, "If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now I say, now you say, we see." And your guilt remains. And I want you to note there the interesting kind of uh, play on words or twist that Jesus is making here. It's reflective on the gospel of Mark, and that is Jesus has come to care and heal and love the sick. And those who are healthy need no doctor. They assume they need no doctor, and they will not seek out the doctor. But those who see their sickness and seek out the healer will be healed by the grace of God. And so Jesus... Uh, addresses this idea of judgment, but he uses it to draw the focus back to his own person and the salvific work that he does on the cross. Second passage that I wanted to look at with you is from Mark chapter, or from Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12. And it's from the very first uh, verse of the chapter, Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And he said to them, 
Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now what I want to do, just briefly about this passage, I want you to note the, the, the importance that Christ placed on the role of mercy in the life of the church. That is, just to say it simply, we uh, as the Church of Christ have a responsibility to be merciful. In fact, our own Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 1 addresses the Sabbath, but does not leave out our obligation to do what is merciful on the Sabbath. Um, and so we might say this quite simply, the worship of God is united with mercy. This brings us to our last section together today. And that is sort of the larger lessons for us. How should we now live uh, in light of what we've kind of heard from the life of the church through these plagues and our own circumstances? The first I want to uh, talk about is this, and it's um, <clears throat> and it, it, at moments it might seem quite simple, but oftentimes I feel it's it's oftentimes overlooked. Excuse me, <clears throat> and that is the church itself has an ethic. That is. We can't understand the church simply in its function, but rather we also have to understand the church in its ethical life. That is, uh, the great commandment applies to how the church is to live, to love God and to love our neighbors. Uh, one author uh, puts it this way, to put it plainly, the Christian ethic in a time of plague considers that our own life must always be regarded as less important than that of our neighbor. And that's, that's a, such a great challenge that we see throughout the church, and that is when we look at Cyprian's own words, when we look at the work of the priests in the, in the, in the great plague of the 14th century, when we look at the words of Luther, we continue to see this call that, my, that the love of God, uh, his love for me, the great commandment to love God and to, my, to love my neighbor compels me to love and care for my neighbor in their sickness. And now we're going to get to some more implications of that in a little bit, but I wanted, wanted to draw on this kind of broader implication, and that is the church's life is an ethical life. The church's life is a life of loving God and expressing that love uh, to others around us. And so the great challenge for us always in the church is when we... Uh, when, when challenges and struggles come upon us, whether we are a church that folds in on itself, whether we are a church that expands outward and seeks God's kingdom outward and seeks to serve and care for those who are hurting, who are suffering, um, as a way of expressing the great love that God has given us, or to use more Lutheran language, as a way of gratitude for the way that God has loved us. The church has an ethic. The church is an ethical thing. It's an ethical institution. It's an ethical body. It's an ethical bride. It lives, and it lives in the light and love and life of God, our triune God. Um, secondly is uh, oftentimes um, the first reaction we have as individuals is to point the finger at somebody else for what's occurring in our lives. Uh, this happens with the plagues. The use of the judgment of God was always t used to point the finger outward towards somebody else. It was the Jewish community that has created this suffering. It was this other group's sin that created this suffering. It was your things that you're doing that you need to reform uh, that's created this plague uh, that is before us. But what I want to do is challenge us, and I think the first thing that we should be um, compelled to do in the midst of a pandemic or plague is to consider who God is. Instead of seeking out the source and seeking out to point the blame at somebody else, it's rather to turn our eyes to the Lord, to be reminded of who God is. We are 
almost always, if I might, not, if I dare say, always confused about our current circumstances, about the life before us, about our own challenges, about why things are happening to us in this way, uh, because we have, because we have turned our eyes from who God is, and how, and when we turn to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we consider Him, and we consider who He is, we then receive and are uh, the things around us. There is a light that is shed upon those things that give us a right understanding of our situation. So simply said, one of our initial reactions in our time now and in previous times would be to call ourselves to know God, to know God himself, to turn to his word, uh, to be grounded in his revelation. The second thing I might bring up is that, especially in our context, is that we are about to deal with a time when the pandemic is not affecting us as it has been. <clears throat> and we have uh, lived uh, in a, a very solitary time. I believe you and I have both, um, we, have, we have both dealt with a time that has been much more solitary and alone than, than, than any other time uh, in my life than I can imagine. And I imagine the same for you. And, uh, and it leads us to be reminded that those around us are dealing with that same solitude, that same uh, solitary isolation. And as the church and as, the, and as our society comes out of this pandemic, uh, one, of the, one of the great expressions that the church has is the expression of the love of Christ towards us, that Christ seeks us and desires to be in relationship with us. And that those who have been isolated, who have felt alone for months on end, who have only known their own, the walls of their own house because they've lived in fear, can now know the confidence and the joy and the comfort of the love of Christ who comes to us and seeks us and loves us. So I think there's a great opportunity for us as the church to uh, bear the hope of the gospel that Jesus loves us, that he cares for us, that he desires to be in relationship with us, that he draws us uh, heavenly to the throne of God. <clears throat> and I think uh, that also brings us to sort of uh, addressing, uh, I mean, uh, something that I think is going to be complex. And if I'm honest with you, I'm also still wrestling with it as I, as I share it with you. And so there may think, be things that you will we'll talk about here that I will lightly tread upon and for fear that uh, I, I don't have it all there. And so should I, should I kind of drift and, and say something that, that's not, not pr uh, completely appropriate I just ask for your forgiveness in that uh, ahead of time. But I wanted to to address maybe this question of of the implications of loving our neighbors, um, and, and with three elements to that. And one is this: uh, in, in as we read through the Bible, and we note how uh, how communities dealt with lepers, you'll notice that they were cast to the outside of the walls. They were dangerous. They were. Um, they were the people that Christ sought out and loved, um, but yet nevertheless, communities found them to be dangerous and a threat to the well-being of the community. <coughs> Excuse me. So they were cast out to the outside of this out, the outside of the walls of the city, and there they were to be found begging and seeking the help of others. I mentioned the story of Hala. Uh, in the 14th century and how they did something kind of the exact opposite. They saw the sickness arise in a small section of the city and they decided to simply wall off everyone in there and starve them to death as a reaction, as a, as, and we might even say as a Christian reaction, which was not at all appropriate to the fear of the plague. And what I think is somewhat fascinating is currently we live, uh, for lack of better words, in a socially distanced world. And what has happened to us now is we don't have city walls to push people outside of. And, and we certainly are not going to build walls around specific communities, literal walls around communities and starve them to death. <coughs> but what we may be doing is we may be allowing the distance between each of us to create, uh, for lack of a better word, a stigma. That is that everyone beyond us is sick and we're okay. That needs to be addressed in two ways. One, it, it reminds me that I need to address my own heart and who I am. And maybe the confidence I have in my own uh, strength and well-being, uh, and, and it should be something that humbles me. Uh, because as I 
gaze upon the goodness of God. It reminds me of my own sin. Um, but it also, uh, this kind of st stigma that we've placed on others, to, that everyone else out there we're assuming is sick at some level. Not always that way, right? We wear our masks because we care about people. But what I'm concerned about is uh, as the masks are removed, um, how will we react to the person uh, across from us? How will we love them? Um, will we uh, address others in fear? Or will we address, address others with the comfort that we ourselves have received from Christ? Will the stigmas of, uh, of COVID-19 remain? Uh, or will we be uh, confident because of our God and our Savior to care for and love and appropriately uh, go towards those people? In fact, uh, in my notes I have here, God drew near to us, and we can confidently draw near to others uh, with that hope of how God has addressed us. Now, I say draw near to others. I'm obviously not uh, um, encouraging some recklessness towards social distancing. Uh, that would be, in, in, my, in my situation, the furthest thing from what I'm asking you to do. But rather, I want us to consider how God has loved us and how that might be a way in which we can, uh, once the pandemic has passed and once we are more uh, com comfortable and confident without wearing masks, how we might care for and love others uh, around us. I, I, I really, uh, I'm just grateful for our time together. I wanna just end this uh, bringing up uh, two more things with us that we've addressed before. And number one, I wanna encourage us uh, to, to be reminded of who God is and his great love for us and how he sent his only son that we might have life. And I want that and that confidence that we have in the promise of God to be something that fortifies us, that we, you and I might not live in fear, that we might not live uh, in fear of what is to come, but have confidence in the love of God. Such a confidence that was so strong, uh, such a confidence that we saw in those early Christians during the plague of Cyprian.